give people just one more minute here and then we'll uh, <clears throat> go ahead and get started. If you're just joining us, welcome. This is the City of Shoreline Natural Yard Care webinar series. And looks like it is 6.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us on this, uh, what was a quite a beautiful October evening here. <clears throat> My name is Cameron. I am the Environmental Program Specialist here with the City of Shoreline. Uh, and this workshop series is funded with a grant from uh, the Public Health um, King County and Seattle's Hazardous Waste Management Program that seeks to reduce hazards to the community from toxic substances, find safer alternatives, and help us properly dispose of the, the products that we do have. Um, tonight, I'm really excited to have Laura Motter back with us again to talk about how to design a landscape that will be successful here in the Pacific Northwest. So um, if this is your first time, Laura is the Natural Yard Care Program Director at Tilth Alliance. Um, and Tilth promotes natural gardening methods to support our environment and help us conserve resources. Um, and Tilth runs the Garden Hotline, which is a free resource for King County residents um, that you can call during business hours, Monday through Saturday to get help on really just about anything gardening related. So, you know, you name it, pest questions, veggie gardening questions, um, pruning, I, you know, I think it's just the whole range of stuff. So really great resource. And I will share out that phone number uh, and website in the uh, follow-up email to this event. So um, tonight, uh, Laura will, will walk us through how to work with nature to create a landscape that will not only look great, uh, throughout the year, but will be better for our environment, for our pollinators, our birds, wildlife, like salmon, uh, and ultimately for our own health as well. Um, so just a little bit about why the city of Shoreline is doing this. Um, our, you know, our Shoreline community has a really, really strong commitment and ethic around protecting our natural environment. Um, and that includes our streams, lakes, Puget, uh, and Puget Sound, and the wildlife, uh, all the aquatic wildlife like salmon and orca that depend on those systems in addition to our pollinators and, and other terrestrial wildlife. Um, so part of this, this commitment um, kind of pushed our city and our council to pursue uh, Salmon Safe certification. So Salmon Safe is a body, an organization um, that certifies farms and um, different campuses and um, cities as well as some private development. Um, through the lens of whether their, their grounds and their practices and their operations will will uh, be safe for salmon. So, so what we found is that, you know, our whole city and our whole landscape is really connected by um, water. So when it rains, you know, you see this picture kind of looking at um, down at Richmond Beach there, just north of um, the Saltwater Park. And you can imagine the rain falling at the top of that, kind of the top left corner there and, and running off of all of these roofs and roads and houses and lawns and landscapes. Um, and, you know, finding its way into the ditches and creeks and storm drains and then eventually out to Puget Sound. And so um, it picks up, you know, anything that's on it. So if, if you if there's oil on the road or if there's um, pet waste left by the side of the road or if there's, you know, if there's too much fertilizer or if there's pesticides that we're using on our property, those things show up in the waterways. Um, and so they've done a lot of studies in, in the Puget Sound area and they've detected 23 different pesticides showing up in our waterways uh, and more of them actually in urban areas than in agricultural areas. So it really points to these things we use on lawns and, and landscapes in the uh, urban suburban context. Um, they estimate that one third of all the copper in Puget Sound comes from pesticides and fertilizers that contain copper. And copper is just a super terrible thing for salmon, it turns out. So it, it kind of, uh, uh, disorients them, they can't avoid predators, and they can't navigate back to their spawning streams. So, um, and then with, with fertilizers it can lead to algae blooms, uh, which can close, you know, lakes like Echo Lake um, or different lakes around the area, you'll see will be closed periodically because of algae blooms that can be toxic. So um, really we're all connected by the water and what we do on our property does make a big difference um, for the environment. And uh, many of these products that you'll find that are sold in, in lots of you know, stores are also hazardous for you and your family, um, even your pets. Uh, and they're actually not allowed to go in the trash. So they require special handling and disposal. Anything, you know, products like 
uh, weed and feed or, or anything that says caution, danger, or warning um, is not allowed in the trash, but you'll need to take to the hazardous waste disposal, disposal station, um, which you'll learn about later on in the presentation. Uh, and as we'll learn from Laura, you know, often in the long term, these things aren't uh, really what's going to build up a healthy, thriving landscape. So that's what we're in it for. We want to build a, a beautiful, healthy, thriving landscape, uh, but do it in a way that's good for you and your family and good for the environment and the community we all share. So uh, my little spiel here, if you want to, you know, after hearing this talk, um, you want to go pesticide free, you want to help us in our effort to be salmon safe, to protect pollinators, to protect our kids and pets, um, and protect your own health, you can request one of these, um, you know, commit to go pesticide free and uh, get one of these nice metal um, yard signs that you can put, you know, on a fence or a post somewhere in your, your yard. Um, you can go to this website on our, our webpage and request the thing and we'll mail it out to you. Um, so that's the end of my little soapbox. Now, uh, for the fun stuff, we have some awesome raffle prizes. So we've been giving away, um, not actually this exact model, but I have a different uh, similar manual weed pulling tool that's really good for um, dandelions and other cap rooted weeds. And actually, um, I, I believe this time of year is, is actually pretty good for getting some of those um, when they're sending energy down to the roots and the soil's nice and soft right now with, with some of the rain. So um, I have a bunch of those to give away. So stick around um, just by showing up, you'll be entered in the raffle. I also have um, some 15 pound bags of Waltz Organic Earthworm Castings, which are, is an awesome organic soil amendment um, that just is super multi-purpose, can be used uh, in a lot of different ways. And then uh, the one lucky winner, and I forgot to update this slide, but it, uh, we are actually offering one yard of Cedar Grove organic compost delivered to your home. So I know for a lot of folks, that's a big barrier um, you know, to adding compost to their soil is just physically going out and getting enough. Um, so you do have to be a shoreline resident, and if you stick around to the end, you will, um, I'll have a question where you can opt in to that raffle, um, but everyone else, um, you're just by showing up, you're entered into the raffle for the first two, and I will announce that in a follow-up email, um, and just a few housekeeping things before I turn it over to Laura. Um, we will be going till about, um, let's see, 740-ish, 7.45. Um, and then we'll stop and take questions. So we'll most likely be wrapped up by um, right around eight o'clock. Uh, you can use the Q&A button on Zoom. So like I mentioned before, that should be in a black bar either at the top or the bottom of your screen. There's also a chat um, feature if you need help. And uh, on the QA thing, you know, use that, type in your questions as they go. You can also like somebody else's question if they have the same question as you. So that'll bump it up to the top of the list and make sure we, we answer it. Um, yeah, and like I said, all the links and also a recording, this is being recorded. So we'll send out, I'll send out a link to that with all the report uh, resources that we mentioned in this presentation, um, along with the raffle prize winners um, in an email tomorrow. So look out for that. And I think that's all I got. So Laura, without further ado, ado uh, welcome and feel free to start sharing your screen. Great, thank you. Um, it's, I'm disabled from- Sorry, sure. real quick, I forgot. <laughs> I had a, I have a poll um, I wanna have oh, you yeah, guys yeah. pull out. That's good. So, okay, I'm gonna launch this poll. This is just an icebreaker and it helps us kind of gauge where folks are coming from tonight. So if you don't mind, please just take a quick minute or two and fill out this poll um, that should be showing up on your screen. So just a few questions to see who we have with us tonight and um, kind of what, what practices you, you currently use in your landscape. I'll give people just like two or three minutes.
sounds like the poll isn't showing up for a couple people. So um, that's weird. One of those fun technical difficulties that you never expect. So I don't know why that's happening. Um, haven't run into that before. Um, so, but yeah, I guess you're off the hook there. But it looks like most of us uh, have, have voted, have polled. So thank you very much. I'll just give folks like 10 more seconds um, to finish that last, um, last couple questions there. Awesome, thanks, Lynn. Okay, thanks everybody. Appreciate you filling that out. And now I'll turn it over to Laura. I'm, di I'm still disabled, Cameron, from sharing. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. One second. And I might have to stop sharing. Can you share it now? Nope. Here we go. Okay. All right. All right. That's working. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get this PowerPoint up for everybody and then I want to check and make sure people can see it once I launch it for real. How's that looking? We good? That looks good. Yeah, I can see it looks like I can see the whole slide just about. Okay. So great, thank you um, everybody for joining us tonight. We're gonna talk about some design elements and plant choices uh, that you would make when you're trying to revamp a garden or put a new garden in. Um, there's lots of opportunity to continue using these skills even after you've established a garden. You'll find sometimes that plants didn't quite work in the spot you thought they would. Maybe you need to move it or it's not quite as big as you want or got too big. So um, we're gonna go through some points that will help you make choices to help you avoid most of those issues. Uh, but sometimes you still need to uh, change things and then sometimes you want to because you see a plant you really like uh, and you wanna add it to the mix. So of course, everything starts with soil. And in the last class we did last week, we did a deep dive into soil and um, what soil is and how to amend it and make it good for plants, uh, what kind of plants like different kinds of soils. This week, we're gonna just talk briefly about soil uh, to point out that in the Northwest, our soils come from a variety of um, geological uh, factors, uh, events that have happened over a long period of time. So soil is built up over many, many years. Uh, it's not something that can be created easily uh, and it varies depending on where you are in the region. So in the Northwest and in the Puget Sound Basin, we have a lot of glacial till and that's true especially of sort of the upper um, higher areas between Puget Sound and between Lake Washington. Uh, there's hard pan. If you dig hard and far enough, you can get into some soil that's almost impossible to break up. Uh, there's a lot of outwash soils from um, water moving and that can carry a lot of gravel in it. Uh, lake and marine bed soils. So like around the areas of Lake Washington when the ship canal went in, a lot of land was exposed and so there's a lot of soil in those areas that's very um, silty and very fine particled because it used to be underwater and, and it's very different from soils that would be higher up on the hillside. And then of course volcanic ash and mud flows from uh, volcanic eruptions have uh, led to all this. Um, in the lake and marine bed soils too you also have uh, the outwash soils, the lake marine bed soils, you have the rivers that run through that create, you know, meandering paths and that's where some of the richest farming soil would be found in the northwest and why um, a lot of farms are, are built in those types of valleys and areas. 
So these are just this picture of Mount Baker on the left. And then I, this is glacier probably in Alaska, but we had a lot of glacial activity, which is how, of course, Puget Sound was created. So all of these soils eventually lead to clay soil, sandy soil, loam soil. Um, and we wanna know what soils in our yard so we know what kind of plants we can plant. So we know how to amend it if we need to. Um, sometimes if your soil's super uh, full of clay, you may need to add a lot more compost to it in order to grow the things that you wanna grow or you can adapt to the clay soil and grow things that don't mind growing in clay soil. But evaluating the soil conditions is important. You can of course do soil testing and send uh, soil samples to the King Conservation District for King County um, residents. But a really simple way to get a picture of what's going on with your own soil, soil profile in your area. And remember that urban soils can be very different from the native soil that used to be there because fill has been added during construction, soil was taken away and then brought back. Um, but you can still get a good profile and you can do this in different areas of your yard because you may find that this is different depending on where you're trying to grow something. So basically you take a jar, a glass jar, um, and you fill it up about a third full of garden soil. And you want to dig down to where the plant roots will probably be growing, about eight inches. And then you add water to that and you leave about an inch space at the top. You add about a teaspoonful of uh, liquid dish soap and this is going to help uh, to get the soil to sort of settle um, as we're trying to get it to do. You shake it for three to five minutes and five minutes is a long time if you've never done this. It does take um, a little muscle. Um, you can pass it around to family members and let other people help. Um, then you set it aside and let it settle. Uh, you're going to see better results after a day or so, but what's going to happen is the particles are going to filter out and the bigger particles, which are the sand, are going to go to the bottom then you're gonna get sort of that silty layer and then you're gonna get the clay layer, which is the uh, most fine material at the top. Um, you'll see water above that and sometimes you'll see things sort of floating in it and dark material, that's the organic matter in the soil uh, that sort of floats around in the water. But proportionally to that amount you put in, you can see what uh, kind of soil you have. So in this case, this is a sandier soil than not, but it's not a bad composition. It's got some clay and some silt. And then when you add organic matter to this, you would have pretty decent soil base. And then another thing that we need to think about, of course, is where is the sun in your yard? And how does it change through the year? Um, do you have variable exposure um, even during the day? Uh, does it change? I have areas in my backyard that get good morning sun and then later parts of those same areas get hotter afternoon sun. So I can choose to put something that prefers a good amount of light and sun and heat in those areas and then choose the shadier parts that get shaded in the afternoon for the things that don't like the sun. So of course this picture is full of palm trees which you know we don't have fields of palm trees here but I wanted to use this to illustrate how light can be very different even when you think you're in the same space. So there's some areas that are bright and this is because of how plants are placed in the landscape. So they can actually shade the, each other. They can shade uh, what's ahead of them and depending on where the sun's moving, you know, shade around them. Uh, buildings can do the same thing. Uh, so, you know, you wanna be aware of that. In uh, our area now, you know, we have a lot more construction that has been going on uh, for years now and people um, putting higher houses up or townhouses or condominiums <clears throat> and in the urban areas that can change the exposure that you had in your yard to begin with. So you might be in the position where you had things growing quite well but now you get shade at different times of day than you used to because the building went up next door and you have to adapt and this is where what we're talking about tonight can help you to choose different plants you could put in there. So geographic impacts, like I mentioned, the buildings nearby, um, some buildings can be quite tall um, and cast quite a shadow. Some things are smaller. Um, do you have trees in the neighbor's yard? Are there trees in the vicinity that might cause shade? Um, the picture on the bottom, that's the Good Shepherd Center in Wallingford where Tilt offices are located. And uh, the cottonwood poplars in the front um, 
are quite tall and they shade quite a bit, you know, when the sun moves around behind them. But to, fortunately, those plants are really on the east side of the building and northeast. Um, so the garden where we're standing looking from in this picture doesn't get um, any impact from that or from the building itself. It's out in the open. Um, you also want to think about as you're designing things for your yard, where are the views from your house? So if you're inside your house looking out the kitchen window, what do you want to look at? What do you want to look at from the living room, from the dining room, from, you know, whatever space, your bedroom, whatever space it is that you want to get a view from, what are you looking at out the window? And you can place plants so that they will screen for you uh, when you're in your house or that give you a good view, something you can appreciate looking at. And then of course you want to think about where the slopes are in your yard, the way water is going to move through the garden. Um, in this case, um, whether or not you want to leave it the way it is. We've got a lawn on a slope which is going to always dry out and be hard to water. You can remove all that and put in ground covers instead. Um, and then because it's a slope, keeping uh, in line with the fact that this is going to still, you know, be li liable to dry out, you might want to put in things that are a little more drought tolerant. You could put in a perennial garden that's drought tolerant, that's good for pollinators. So there's a lot of different options you can think about. Um, and then what direction are they facing? So what direction do these slopes face? Is it catching the morning sun or the afternoon sun? That's going to make a difference as to the heat and intensity of the sun that that space gets. So this little schematic shows what happens when you put in things as a windbreak. Things can double as windbreaks and screens and also be focal points for you to look at. And so this is showing that the wind changes speed depending on where it's moving through and what it's moving through. Different kinds of trees have different branching structures. Um, if you have big conifers in your yard, the general rule of thumb is to make sure that you open them up a little bit so that the wind can move through them to some degree so they aren't becoming um, just a big sail that the wind hits and tries to push over. You're going to get less damage on your um, limbs that way. So these are just examples showing how the wind can be different in different parts of your yard. You know, the wind may have a, you know, be blowing at 35 miles per hour, but in different parts of your yard, it's going to be um, different speeds. So you can plan accordingly. Some plants don't like the wind. Some plants are uh, susceptible to damage from wind. Um, so that's something to think about. And then there's a lot of other effects that can come from the weather. So the prevailing winds in our area are from the southwest or the north. Um, southwest brings us a lot of warmer rainy, stormy weather. Um, you know, we talk about the um, Pineapple Express coming up from Hawaii, and that is usually warmer rain, and it can get quite windy. Uh, we get colder, more frigid weather out of the north. Um, you want to look at what's exposed in your yard and what is protected and what's protecting it. You may have some things that have um, <clears throat> reflection coming off of them. If you have a light colored building or a, a very light colored uh, surface uh, patio or walkway, that can actually reflect light off of it. If you have metal objects in the yard, like maybe you put in a metal cistern that's, you know, aluminum and it's going to reflect out or stainless steel and it's going to reflect out um, into the garden, that will have effects on the plants around it. You can capitalize on that and, and try to help um, plants that need more light by putting them in places where they're going to get that extra sort of reflective light. Um, you want to think too about do you have large deciduous trees in your yard? Um, they will shelter the house from the sun in the summer, but they will let a lot more light in during the winter. Um, if you don't have one and you want one, you need something that can shade maybe the hotter part of the house. It's something to think about, um, something that would grow up safely, not something that you would worry about toppling over on the house, but something you put out in the yard at a distance that can grow up and then um, have those kinds of effects for your home. 
you can put things in groupings that that can provide an efficient windbreak kind of like we saw in that picture before but i also want to encourage you not to just think about groupings in terms of a line like a fence but in terms of um, more three-dimensional Na natural systems aren't plants don't grow in a line they grow in groupings um, naturally because of course their seeds fall and birds disperse things nearby and so uh, think about that when you're trying to design something as well, um, partially for um, weather effects, but also just for the way it looks. And then evergreen plants through the winter, whether they're conifer or broadleaf evergreen, have this um, miraculous um, effect on things around them because they continue to, uh, to um, transpire and let air out during the winter. They're still, uh, um, a little, they're not completely dormant like a deciduous tree would be that loses its leaves. So they are breathing. And as they breathe, they warm up the air around them and they create frost free pockets. So I've had effects like this from uh, laurels that were on a parking strip that we ended up taking out because it's a terrible plant for a parking strip in the city. But while they were up, when I parked my car next to it, I never got frost on my car windows on that side, you know, depending on which way I was facing on the street, that side of the car would be frost free and even so much as about half the windshield, sometimes the whole windshield, depending on how, you know, if it wasn't too cold. But once we took those down, I had really hard frosts when we got frosted on my car and then I had to scrape my windows. So plants can provide quite a lot of service in that effect. Um, I also had an area in a, a house I used to live in that had a little tiny lawn and it was surrounded by spruces and um, Douglas fir and sequoia and different um, large conifers. And the neighbors to the west of me up the hill had big large lawns in front of their house and no plants. Their lawns were completely frosted over and mine stayed green unless it was, you know, the frostiest of nights. So that happened in my yard because I had this grouping of plants that surrounded the lawn and actually warmed up the environment around it. So you can take advantage of this. We call these microclimates. In your yard, you're gonna find lots of different areas that have different sort of temperature effects. You, have, you may have brick or rock, um, like the picture on the right, these little rocks um, you know, you can plant little flowers next to them, things that will, you know, warm up. So something that can appreciate nighttime warmth um, will benefit from something like brick and rock because it lets the radiate, it radiates the heat back out at night. Um, you could have water features that can warm the air as well as like evergreen plants can. So little pond in there, ponded areas surrounded by plants. Um, and then in those sheltered areas, those are places you might want to think about. You put plants that are a little more tender. So we're going to look at some plants later on here. And <clears throat> some of the plants that can be more tender are things that come from places like New Zealand or California. Um, and they are, they will grow well here. But if we get, you know, really hard frost or freeze, sometimes they're damaged by that. So those are the plants that you might think about, like New Zealand flax. Um, putting into areas that are a little more protected, sheltered, maybe have some radiant heat at night um, and take advantage of that kind of situation. So the main thing you want to think about though is how are you going to use your garden? And everybody has a different answer for this, of course. Some of us have children, grandchildren, some of us have pets, some of us want little maintenance. Um, some people want a lawn to lay out on or not at all. Um, they just want to grow food. So you need to decide what the function of your garden is going to be. And you know, if you are lucky and have a home with a lot of space and garden space, you could do multiple things um, and place them appropriately. Uh, how much time and money do you have to spend? Are you going to you know, want to be doing all the maintenance or not? what works in your neighborhood. So it's a good idea to sort of take a look at that and then take advantage of local expertise because there's a lot of um, people who know a lot in the Northwest who have a lot of experience and that 
is professionals, of course, but sometimes it's also just other people that you know or people that grow in your neighborhood. So here's some Im imaginings about how people use their gardens. So like I said, some people have children, they want a lawn, they want an area to be able to play with the kids and lay out um, our pets. And of course, in this case, you wanna make sure, as Cameron mentioned, that you're not using pesticides on these lawns because you are in direct contact with them and you don't wanna be impacted by that. Um, and then anything you put on this surface um, will wash down into the water table or could run off into concrete areas and move into the street, move into storm drains and get out into our waterways. You might just want areas that you can sit or you want things that are decorative, like this little table actually has seats that you're not gonna sit in because somebody planted them as little planters, which is sweet. But you could pull a chair up here and sit at the table if you wanted to and eat dinner out there. They've used some of the vertical spaces on their fence too to hang things. So don't forget about that, that you actually have areas you can go up to do um, multiple um, sort of tiers of plants. Uh, you can do this with pots by setting one pot inside another, going from really large to small at the top and, and uh, make use of vertical space. Um, but that's another way to think about it. The yard on the right, um, they're a little more natural. They have a lot of forget-me-nots blooming. A lot of people consider this a weed and, what, and the dandelion you see there. One of the reasons I wanted to put this in here is that I let uh, forget-me-nots go crazy in my yard in the spring and then I just pull them out where I don't want them later on and there's seed there and they'll come back next spring and then they'll bloom and I'll have all these beautiful blue flowers during the spring. But I do that partially because I like it, but mostly because they really are good food for early bumblebees. So these guys, I've seen lots of little tiny bumblebees all over them as they're uh, just emerging and um, they bloom early. So they're a great early feed. Uh, these guys also have a compost bin back there. So they're doing some composting as well um, in this garden. Um, you might want to grow lots of flowers and have vines and roses and you know different sort of classic plants for your yard like all these daylilies and the wisteria in this picture or you might want to grow food. Um, chard has done fabulously well this year. It's a super ornamental plant. Uh, I've been enjoying mine. It's beautiful. I have three different colors. I have a yellow, a, a green and white and a sort of orangey one. And when the light comes through them like this, it's, it's pretty spectacular. So my vegetable beds are in raised troughs. They're mixed into my beds in the back and I have perennials in between them so that I have a more decorative effect even with my vegetable garden. And then you wanna make sure that you have access for everything you need to do. That's not just about enjoying the garden. So where's your garbage and your tool mate and your tool um, storage. Where are you um, locating, where are your utilities located? Are they accessible? You're not planting a plant right in front of them. You're not planting something that's delicate that somebody has to step on or over or around or, or break as they're trying to read your meter. Um, you need to maintain your house. So, you know, it's a very classic thing to see people put plants right up against the side of a house, but it's not always the best idea to have it right up against the house. When you need to paint it, you end up having to prune it. And that's not always the best thing for the plant. Uh, so putting things there that either can take seasonal pruning, like maybe you need to prune it every year, like a rhododendron that you don't want to get too large or a hydrangea that, you know, you're trying to keep to a certain size. Those are easy enough to prune and they take the pruning, but you don't want to put something there that's going to be um, damaged by having to be annually pruned, if, if, especially if you need to get through and you know, get, get to your windows to wash them or paint the house, or that sort of thing. You also want to be able to move through the garden. So you know, where are your pathways? Where are, where are the lines of access getting in and out to the gate, um, moving the compost in and out if you need to, or the garbage? Uh, that sort of thing. And then just for maintaining the garden. Um, when you're putting in beds like a vegetable bed, you want to make sure it's not too big in terms of length because you don't want to have to walk all the way around it to get to the other side of it. Typically, 
veggie beds are built at about a four by eight foot size for that reason because we have about a two foot arm span that we can reach into the middle to maintain it and weed it out. And then you can walk around it and get to the other side and move around um, and weed as you go. So you wanna keep that in mind, you need breaks if you're gonna do sort of more raised bed style gardens. And some people do raised beds just for flowers as well and shrubs, um, or they do a combination of that as well. And then of course you wanna think about What's this costing you? How much time are you gonna spend on this? How, um, how detailed are you gonna be? How much work do each of these plants need? Um, you know, it's always better to choose something that's not gonna need a lot of extra care in terms of uh, extra uh, pesticides. You want things that are disease resistant, pest resistant. Uh, pests will happen more likely if your plant is stressed, they'll be more susceptible to pest damage. So it's not that they're not gonna get pests on them even if they're healthy, but they can resist the damage more and you may not notice much damage on them. But if they're a little more stressed, uh, this is especially true with diseases, you're gonna get um, more effects from diseases and pests. So keeping them healthy, putting them in the right place to begin with, um, putting the, the right size plant in the right place, and then being, um, really honest with yourself about how much work does this take. A rose is, you know, hybrid tea rose is going to take a lot more work than a, a shrub rose will. Um, and there's some really beautiful shrub roses. There are some uh, that are sort of rambling roses that you can trellis up a trellis and they may only bloom once during the summer, but they're glorious when they bloom because they're full of flowers. So, you know, keeping those things in mind and then how much money do you want to put into this? Do you want to, you know, start your own plants? Do you want to propagate things? Do you want to go to the nursery and buy stuff? Um, I love going shopping at the nursery, um, but, you know, I save that mostly for things like these annuals that you see in the picture here um, that are seasonal and that I don't have a place to start at home. I don't have a a good grow system here. It's a small house and I don't have a place in the yard for any kind of greenhouse space. So typically I will, um, I'll start a few things out in my backyard that are easy, but other things like a begonia or geranium I typically will purchase. Um, and then you need to think about what your soil amendments might cost. If you're trying to really change an area, you know, and the soil isn't quite right for the plants you're thinking about, you're going to need to manipulate that soil. What are you going to do there? And um, are you going to build a deck? Are you going to put a pathway through? Is it gravel? Is it pavers? How much does all that cost? Uh, how hard it is? Is it going to be on your back? Um, that kind of thing. So keep all that in mind. It's just important to be realistic. And sometimes it helps to just take one space at a time and reimagine that. You don't have to do a whole yard at once. Um, and you can think about that and put in, you know, like the foundation plants that are going to be the, the permanent plantings and evergreen shrub or tree, that kind of thing, and then work around from there. Great way to get ideas. So go to local gardens. Um, the Witt Winter Garden at the uh, University of Washington um, Botanical Garden, the Arboretum, has fantastic uh, plants for winter showiness that, um, you know, we're coming up on that season, early, usually January, early February is a really great time to go through there. These um, dogwoods shrubs are there. So this is a form of a red stem dogwood that has sort of the flame like look to it. It goes from yellow to orange to red at the top. Um, these kinds of plants, we're going to look at some more in a few minutes, but these guys, you need, you need to do some pruning on them in order to keep that color coming and then some of them you don't. So you can kind of do research on which will always have lots of good color in the bark in the wintertime. Um, they have a lot of witch hazel that bloom there and camellia and snowdrops in the ground and all kinds of really cool, um, interesting hollies that aren't English holly. Um, so it's really fun to go take a look. But there's lots of other gardens um, to look through. And then also take a look in your neighborhood. So, you know, just walk around. Um, you might find a plant in somebody's yard that you think is delightful you've never seen before. And 
you can meet the neighbor by, you know, asking them what it is. Um, I've, I've actually found a lot of interesting plants that way and seen a lot of really um, interesting uses of plants too. It's a, a, the other thing you get is ideas about how to set things out or put a walkway in, that kind of thing. So here's an idea of some of the places that are local to Shoreline and Shoreline is blessed with two of the best botanical gardens in, uh, in the area. Um, the Krukeberg Garden and the Dunn Garden, both are fabulous places. Um, you know, true horticulturist, horticulturalists have been, you know, working on these for years. The Krukeberg family, you know, is, is like an institution in the Northwest. And certainly um, I studied botany at the UW. So, you know, the professor was still alive at the time and there um, with me. Um, when I went to school, he wasn't fully teaching, but um, really great um, examples of ideas uh, of things you can do uh, from ornamental to more naturalistic settings. Um, then if you want to get an idea about the Twin Parks Community Garden, you, um, you can look at a vegetable garden setting and see kind of different ideas people have. So pea patches are always a great place to get an idea about how to do your veggies. Uh, so many of them are ornamental as well. So you can have a functional garden or you can have one that you actually add uh, plants to your garden beds um, and just make them part of the mix. Like a rhubarb plant, for instance, has a very architectural look to it. <clears throat> and if you have the right soil, you can mix it in with other shrubs and things and then just harvest straight from the shrub bed. Um, but then also I would go to the Washington Park Arboretum. It's a fabulous place to walk around and see plant collections. And there's a great herbaceous um, garden over at the Center for Urban Horticulture. As you park in the parking lot to the east, if you walk through as you're going up into the buildings, uh, there's some fabulous plants in there. And I would go different seasons because there's always something different happening in that garden that you wouldn't notice if you were there in the fall. You can only see it in the spring. There's some ephemeral plants and things that bloom at different times. So all of these are really great places to go to get ideas. And then these are just examples of different gardens in the Northwest that people have put together. Um, some of them are much more complicated than others. Obviously these two have a lot going on in them. There's a lot of um, perennials mixed in um, but the one on the right, for instance, most of the plants that you see in this, in this uh, photograph are not difficult plants to grow and they don't require a lot of maintenance. There's very little that needs to go on with them other than you know, a little bit of grooming now and then. Um, even, even to the fact that you don't need to divide them very often, uh, they kind of mind, their, mind themselves. Um, the one on the left, pretty much the same too. Uh, it's a little bit different texture setting. It's a little sunnier. So it's, you know, you see more of a shade garden look on the right and a sunnier garden on the left. Uh, and then what you're going to see in some of these is these taller plants that are blooming or have the seed heads on them. They'll need a little bit of grooming and a little more tending to, but still not a tremendous amount of work. You're trying to let these ground covers fill in and, and take up bare space. So you have very little weeding to worry about. Um, Plants grow in competition with each other. So for you to compete with weeds, this is true in your lawn as well as in a shrub bed, uh, you um, actually just want to plant a lot of plants so that they will outcompete the weeds for you. And then these are some gardens that are in shoreline that were actually done through the uh, rebate program. Um, and, and these are examples of things you can substitute if you're removing lawn um, and this is something else you could do. The garden on the right is a rain garden. It's a really beautiful rain garden that has a feed uh, coming off the house and um, coming quite a distance to come down into this garden. And they've filled it up, you know, to look kind of like a rock creek, a creek bed, rocky creek bed. Uh, and they've put plants in the bottom, of course, that will handle some seasonal ponding. And then the plants that come up the sides sort of grade eight, uh, grade, great away from needing more water to not needing as much water at the top. Um, and then the one on the right is a little more drought tolerant. So this is a, a open rockery with a lot of plants that can handle being out in the sun. 
and um, in, in droughty, more droughty conditions. Now, any plant that you put in needs water for the first two years. So you need to make sure that you're irrigating during the summer. And then in July, August, everything should be checked anyway, just to be sure. Uh, as we, if we have really dry June in particular, things are, are gonna be stressed if we don't give them a little supplemental water. But you can create gardens that don't need to be watered, except for maybe, you know, once a week during the hot season. And this is also through the Soak It Up rebate program showing a before and after picture. And then uh, you can imagine this picture under these cedar trees, this is gonna fill in. So these, shrub, these shrubs and perennials and things and ground covers that have been put in here um, will fill in and this will become a more robust garden uh, at the base of these trees rather than just sort of some sketchy grass that will never grow because there's too many um, uh, cedar uh, needles on the ground. So that's, these are examples of things that you could think about for your own gardens as well. But the thing you're gonna do for yourself is to map your garden. So you wanna check out where your soil conditions are in all different parts of the garden. And this is just a big house lot. So we're kind of identifying what kind of soils we have that might be problematic. Um, if the rest of your yard looks pretty decent, you can just sort of chalk that up and go, okay, I got that, that's okay. But wow, up here in front when I, where I come into the house, it's super sandy. And then on the other side of the house and the north side of the house, the, the land kind of drops off and it gets kind of boggy and wet. And I don't know that I wanna put any effort into changing either one of those things too much. Um, maybe I wanna put my money into plants rather than trying to amend the soil. You wanna know where the sun is. So obviously in this house, the sunny side is um, in the back, there's a sunny hot area. And then you're gonna get actually a lot of sun in that front area as well. Um, during the summertime, less, a little bit less so in the winter because it's sort of a north, northwest corner. But as you get further over here, you get a little warmer, hotter weather. Um, but the biggest sunniest spot is here. And then these guys have put in what I was talking about is a more three-dimensional three sort of uh, tree and shrub border has already been put in here. And then this is sort of shaded by the house as well. Um, you want to understand where your winds are coming from and if you have any wind breaks. Um, you want to assess where your microclimates are, which would include areas like here near, near the porch, which are very sheltered and um, these trees are blocking wind and the house is blocking the wind coming from the southwest. So this is going to be a very sheltered area. And then uh, where's your maintenance? So here they have a little shed in the back and how do you access that? It doesn't show you if there's an alley or any way out, but <clears throat> you can imagine, you know, sort of different scenarios with that. And then when you've got that down, oops, you want to then make a plan with it. And so now we've started to pop things into the map. Um, here's where the prevailing winds are coming out of the Southwest. We still have this area you can, boost this by adding more things to it. You could put lower level shrubs. I would add more shrubs sort of mixed into this um, and kind of fill it out a bit more. It's gonna be a shade, part shade setting um, and you have shade against the house. So this whole area over here could be a great place to sort of capitalize on making a wildlife garden and putting a lot of native plants into it. Um, you can put a shade tree over here. So it blocks the view of your shed uh, a little bit and you know you're not like looking direct, directly at your utility site maybe you have all your garbage cans sitting back here your recycle bin and your compost bin and then the sunny hot area you know lawns and vegetables compete for the sunny hot areas so we are looking at here you know doing a combination you could set that up any way you want um, best to have the vegetable garden accessible to the house so that you're not having to go a long way to get to it or you're gonna not work in it as often. So you wanna think about, you know, reality about how far, you know, how far is the water, how far is the hose need to run? Um, am I gonna put drip irrigation in this? Um, and if so, can I set that up properly? And then you can have all three. You can have a veggie garden, a lawn, and then you can do sort of a herb garden here in this very sheltered area, very close to the house where you can just nip out and pick things off the patio. 
You could even put it up in here in pots if you'd rather, um, things like that. And then you've got a dry shade area. You could do a shade garden here. There's a lot of plants that don't uh, mind dry shade. The plant lists that you have in your resource sheet can help you with that, in particular the one called the plant list or plant list. Um, dry shade plants do really well um, under conifers and uh, can compete with the fact that the conifer is taking all the water of the soil and there's no rain getting to the ground most of the time because the plants are evergreen. And then over on the north side, where it's a little bit sunnier, you could think about putting blueberries in, or you could, uh, to the side that isn't so much, you could do sort of a shade bog garden. There are plants that would, would tolerate that and just tolerate that soil and capitalize on it. And then in the front, uh, it's a great place to put a winter garden in. There's a lot of plants that um, you would see in that uh, garden at the Arboretum that don't mind sandy soils and you could mend the soil a bit with some compost just to hold water better, but you could put in things that would bloom in the um, early, you know, February, late January period. Something like rosemary, for instance, would work pretty well out here. Uh, I have rosemary in my parking strip. It's very big and I prune it all the time um, to give away and to keep it out of my driveway and out of my, out of the street. And, um, those guys bloom super early. I see hummingbirds all over it in the winter time when the flowers are out there. In fact, it's mine is starting to bloom right now. Um, you could put in things like um, the uh, witch hazel um, or those uh, red stem dogwoods things. Also things that have beautiful bark, like there's certain kinds of maple that have striped bark or peeling bark, um, stewardias that have beautiful different kinds of bark. So this is an area to sort of feature because you are coming and going from this area all the time. And you could put in things like sarcococa that blooms in the winter, um, late winter, and is sort of your first hint of spring. Very, very sweet smell. And on a warm day, it's very fragrant. Uh, so you would catch that as you came into the house. So there's a lot of ways to think about this. You, you know, you're looking at this to think about how do I use my garden? And these are just ideas that I would use because this is part of how I would like to experience my garden. So when you're choosing plants, which we're gonna get to, um, one of the things you want to know about an area you live in is what zone you're in. So when, you, when you're looking at plant hardiness, you're figuring out, can that tolerate being here? Or am I on the edge of that? Um, people that live a little higher into the um, foothills of the Cascades are going to have a little cooler temperatures, earlier frost dates, later warming periods. And then, um, of course, if you're living in other parts of the country, um, you'll see a variety of differences. So the USDA has a plant hardiness zone map, and this is based on the degree temperature that plants can do well at. Um, and so they, they've divided some of the areas into A's and B's, and that's a little more recent development. They put that out, I think, in um, like 2012, finally, based on temperatures that they were tracking up to about 2005. So it's really time for a redo on this again, but there's a lot of politics around it. Sometimes um, there's dis you know discussion about climate change that gets into the picture, but with our climate changing, which it is, we are seeing an increase in temperature. And the reason this map got changed is because of that, because they were seeing that um, uh, nor the average temperatures had changed. So this is USDA, and then they, you can look at the state level on this map and see what they have to say about that. But then also there's the Sunset Garden, um, Western Garden Book maps. And so they have a different number system, so don't let that confuse you. They've renumbered everything and they just do it for the West Coast. And so in this one, I like this map because you can look and see Wow, if you're up in the top of the mountains in the Olympics, of course, it's much colder. But even here, if you're moving out here past Redmond, it's cooler. Um, and Everett and up going north Bellingham. And we know this, if we know, if we've been in those areas and we know people live there, we've lived there ourselves, it is cooler kind of along the sound than it is right in the Puget Sound Basin. 
So really further down here where we're kind of more sheltered and between the mountain ranges more dramatically. So we are in the warmest zone here. You guys are getting closer to that convergence zone and that's kind of where that line is, where the weather changes a bit right up in here. So let's look at choosing plants. Basically, when you wanna choose plants for your garden, you're choosing things that are gonna do well in the area that you are putting them in. So you don't have to do a lot of extra work, you can enjoy them and they can grow um, and be successful there. So one of the things we always tell people is to group plants together that have like needs. So if they need boggy soil, like this bog garden on the right, then put those guys together. You don't want to put plants in there like a lavender if that's wet soil, it's not gonna do well there. Um, if it's a drought tolerant, same thing. You don't want to have to go in there and just pick out those couple of plants that need supplemental watering. You want to water the whole thing at once or not at all. And in this one, you see a lot of carex and different kinds of grasses. Um, the euphorbia and the rosemary, these are all really drought tolerant once established. As I said, you need to water um, for a while to get them established, get their root systems to go deep enough to be able to find water that they need. Is it shady? Is it sunny? Um, you know, you're not going to put um, something like a hosta out in the bright, bright sun or it's going to just, you know, fry. The leaves won't be beautiful and colorful. They'll be all pale. Um, this is much more efficient for you to take care of. You don't have to worry about changing the soil as much. You don't have to worry about the watering quite as much. Um, you just know you know, this setting needs less water than another and you can water groupings at once. And then we really encourage people to, if they can, choose low water need plants to conserve water. Uh, the more water you conserve, the less water you're putting out. It's cheaper for you. It's also less strain on our water systems. But the other thing about that is water going into a garden or down a slope or running down a driveway even if you're not using pesticides in your yard, if you have a car parked there, there are bits of metal that come off of the tires and the, and, uh, the brake pads and you know off the car, there could be pollution on the car. So there are still elements that could be running down into the storm drain if you are watering more often. So it's just a basic conservation method to try and use the least amount of water you can. Save your water for your vegetable garden or for your, you know, your dahlia garden flowers where you really want, you know, to produce something. So typically we talk to people about looking at Washington natives, which are acclimated to dry summers. They can handle the wet winter, but they also can handle a dry summer. And California and Mexico are dry and sunny. Uh, Mediterranean areas also very dry and they are um, on generally rocky type of slopes with a lot of drainage in the soil and windy conditions so they can handle some drought. Uh, and in New Zealand there's a lot of plants that have really small leaves and the, that's um, an adaptation that happened to reduce transpiration uh, and because they are you know an, an island this was something that happened um, on that island over time. Uh, to develop plants that were uh, different than other parts of the world. So we're going to look at a bunch of native plants. Um, we have many, 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 many native plants in the Northwest. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, this is just a sample of some of the best choices for plants that do well, that are easy to find, uh, that give you a variety of evergreen and uh, deciduous, that give you a variety of uh, ground cover to shrub to small tree to large tree, um, but some of these wouldn't be appropriate for certain gardens. For instance, something like a big leaf maple, that's really only appropriate for, you know, the biggest yard that has space for it. Um, some of our northwest maples have had issues um, and some of the ones that, you know, are out there have declined. And um, so, you know, you want to be careful when putting large trees into any setting to make sure that it's a safe choice for you to have in your garden. <clears throat> but there's a lot of small scale trees. What's interesting in the Northwest with our natives, um, I didn't put alder on here, but alder is another um, uh, tree that sort of spans between the small and the large trees. 
there's not a lot of sort of those mid-sized trees. Most of them are small or they're really big, like the cottonwoods and these, uh, uh, the big leaf maple and these other um, evergreens that I've post, uh, I've listed here. So you want to keep that in mind. If you're looking for a tree-like look, you might look to some of the smaller trees uh, to add to the garden. And also some of these shrubs can be tree-like as well. Things like rhododendrons, depending on what one you put in. Red flower and currant can get eight feet tall. Ocean spray. Um, some of the things we're going to show you, the mock orange, some of those are pretty tall. They just, they tend to be multiple stemmed and they tend to be more shrubby in, in uh, form, so, which is why we call them shrubs rather than small trees. And what we're looking at here on the right is an emerging red stem dogwood leaf and flower bud. Uh, they're really quite beautiful. So even in the winter, you're seeing this red stem, but even in the spring as they're emerging, it's quite a beautiful contrast. And then another same color combination of this red and green is um, in this huckleberry. And this is a picture I took in my own yard of a huckleberry um, in my um, back on my back porch that is right to the left when I step out. And it's kind of that area that gets that shady afternoon uh, spot. Uh, but they have beautiful red new growth and red stems and these beautiful red leaves. I mean, green leaves as contrasts when they're mature. So here we have some of our really common ferns. We have main hair, which is a little more delicate, requires a little more moisture, sometimes likes running water. You know, if you have a pond setting or a shady pond or, you know, you have some kind of mechanism in your yard where you've set up a little waterfall, this is a great plant to put next to it. Uh, sword ferns um, on the far right, on, by contrast, grow in very, um, gravelly and well-drained soil. They can take more sun. They can take more drought. They don't like tons of moisture, but they are a little more adaptable too. I mean, they can handle regular watering. It's not going to hurt them. Uh, but I have one of these in my parking strip that I water maybe twice a year. Um, and then the one in the middle is the deer fern, which looks similar to a sword fern, but it's much smaller and much more um, sort of tight. The fronds are tighter. And these are really beautiful for small scale plantings and for edges of pathways and shady garden sites. Then you have things like wild ginger. There is a European ginger that's sold too that's beautiful and is fine to plant. It's a, it's a shinier leaf. This is the native ginger, Asarum caudatum. And the flower in the middle is the flower of the ginger, which usually isn't very visible. It's kind of hidden amongst those leaves. So if you have an area where, you know, you're stepping up into or down into an area, but it's shady, you know, that would be a great plant to put on the edge of something that you look at, you know, as you're walking up and down. So you might get a, a glimpse of those flowers. Hellebore is not a native, but it has a similar kind of effect where the flowers hang down um, and you don't always get to look at them unless you're walking up um, from below. And then the inside out flower, Vancouveria. Uh, this one is more native to the southern Puget Sound areas, but it is a relative of um, Oregon grape. It's also a relative of Epimedium, which is another uh, horticultural um, plant that can be put in in the same sorts of settings. These guys like that dry soil underneath the conifer. They do really well there. And they'll spread by underground stem and make kind of a clump. They're not invasive. They just sort of fill in nicely. And they have these beautiful little flowers that dangle off of them um, in the late spring. Uh, gra other ground covers, you have things like the dwarf Oregon grape on the left. Uh, there's, this, is, um, this is one of them. There's also a, another one that, they, um, that is um, even a creeping Mahonia that's a little bit different form. It, it actually kind of pops up and makes a more solid ground cover. This is a little more like um, discreet shrubby um, ground cover where you have uh, obviously individual plants. Um, these are edible uh, fruits, I might add. Uh, they don't have a strong flavor, uh, but people do use these. My sister, <laughs> when she was in college, came back one summer, my older sister, and harvested a bunch of Oregon grape and made wine with them. 
Um, so that was fun. But again, you see a same similar kind of color pattern. It's very typical of Northwest. Um, these broadleaf evergreens in the Northwest have that sort of green and red hue a com color combination. Um, the plant on the right is beach strawberry. There's a few different uh, native strawberries. This is the beach one. And this you can use like they did here in between pathways. It will get edible fruit on it. You can actually pick that fruit if you want to. It's a great one for rockeries or cascading over a wall. Um, very drought tolerant once established as well. Um, evergreen huckleberry, and I gave this its own page because this is one of my favorite plants. I think it's a beautiful plant. It's evergreen all year long. It's a wonderful landscaping plant. It's been used in the Northwest since probably the 1970s as a landscape plant because it's, it's just super attractive. And there's a lot of cultivars um, that are you know, created to make more red on the new growth or more um, you know, a, a shape that's more desirable because they can get a little rangy, the species forms of these, but I like the way they look. Um, and so I, do, I don't mind that part of it. But this is one in flower. And these are related to rhododendrons, so they are rhody relative. Here's with the, um, the different new growth coming out, the red new growth. And then this is the fruit on it, which is edible and delicious. So you can grow these and harvest the fruit from them if you can get them before the birds do. Um, red flowering current in Pacific rhododendron, native plants that have beautiful um, color. This uh, red current blooms early in the spring. So this is a great hummingbird food for the Anna's hummingbird. And they have kind of a skunky smell. I like the smell, some people don't like it. It's kind of this skunk, sweet skunk smell to the leaf and flower. Um, they also have edible fruit that's not terribly tasty for us, but the birds like to eat it and they love, hummingbirds love the nectar on this and it's good early bee food as well. And then the rhododendron, the Pacific rhododendron is, um, this is um, one that's gonna get quite large and be um, used you know, as, a, as a main feature in a landscape. And there's lots and lots of hybrids of rhododendrons. You don't need to just use the native ones. There's a tremendous variety of them and they're great landscape plants. Um, the shrubs, again, more shrubs, ocean spray. Uh, again, another one of my favorites. I think that our deciduous shrubs don't get as much attention as something like the evergreen huckleberry. This is really beautiful when it blooms. It's a signal that summer's here pretty much because it's like late May when it's starting to bloom. And um, it, is a, it is an edge plant. It's a coastal plant. It loves, you know, sort of uh, being near the salt water. It also, you'll see it on lots of the islands in the area. Uh, and it is um, super great dense shrub, which makes a lot of thicket in place for um, birds to nest and to roost and to hang out. And then on the right is just a bunch of different kinds of red stem dogwoods, just to give you an example of all the different uh, varieties and uh, cultivars there are out there. There's some that are fully yellow. There's some that are bright, bright red, some that are deep red, some that you know trade, go from red to, to orange to yellow. Um, so huge variety. This is of course the winter color. They are quite nice when they fill out. They do have fruit that the birds like. Um, and it's very useful uh, thicket type setting for them as well. And then again, some more of the deciduous shrubs. So on the top, you see the nine barks. The one on the left is the native. They can get about eight feet tall. They're called nine bark because the bark is striated and it has a lot of different um, color and sort of tone to it. And so in the winter, it's it's kind of cool to look at just by itself. And again, it has sort of those red stem, new stems. The one on the right is a variety of some type of cultivar that could be Diabolo. It's, it, it's, there's a lot of different ones. Some of them that come out kind of bronze and turn green. Some of them like this that stay dark purple. Uh, so those are quite gorgeous and very striking in the landscape. Um, on the bottom is the mock orange and you can see the multi-stemmed um, nature of it. That's typical of this. You want to sort of stay on top of that. These can take a little bit of work in that sense that you don't want them to just go crazy and you don't want to whack just the tops off. You want to put this where it can be as tall as it needs to be so that the pruning you do is to eliminate a stem at the bottom 
you take stems out from time to time and just let it fit, keep filling in. Um, the flowers up close are beautiful. They look like little orange blossoms and they smell like orange flowers. They're extremely fragrant and um, quite beautiful and they get a seed capsule that both of these get seed capsules that birds will eat. And um, I have one of these on my driveway and the birds nest in this guy. Then we get to the small trees, vine maples. Most of us know what those look like. Um, that's the guy on the left. They have that multi-stemmed look or sometimes you can get ones that have been uh, grown to be a single stem. Uh, they are also an edge tree in our forests. So you see them at the edges of the forests. They can handle some sun um, and partial shade. They don't like deep shade. And they again have beautiful fall color. And we have a lot of that red and green going on here. The stems, new stems can be red on these. And then service barrier, Amelanchier is uh, a beautiful shrub that gets covered in these delicate white flowers. It has edible fruit that's great to make jam out of. The birds love it. Um, beautiful fall color. The only downside to these guys is they are prone to a, a rust disease that sometimes makes them not quite as nice to look at. But there are um, there are varieties of these that have been, you know, developed to be a little more disease resistant as well. And then we're getting into the really big trees only for the biggest yards and maybe not even for a residential yard. Gary Oaks, uh, deciduous native oak, um, great wildlife tree, lots of food potential, lots of nesting sites. Uh, these are common more in sort of prairies and the islands uh, where there's drier soils. And then the big leaf maple, which is just ubiquitous to the Puget Sound area um, with the uh, huge leaves and the um, Samaras or the seed capsules that kind of helicopter down when they fall. Uh, these guys are both fantastic wildlife trees if you are lucky enough to have space to grow them. And ditto with these two. These are, you know, for the biggest yards, um, Western Red Cedar and Douglas Fir. And you can see the cedar has more of a scale-like foliage compared to the Doug Fir with the, the needles. Um, both of them have medicinal qualities. They've been used, you know, for millennia by the indigenous um, tribes in the area for, um, for wood, especially the cedar for using to make canoes and making clothing out of and uh, housing. Um, the Douglas fir, the tips of the fir and the spruce and other plants like that have a lot of medicinal properties in them as well. And they both smell fabulous. So there's a wonderful fragrance. They have oils in them. Cedar is one of those really long lasting woods that you build things out of cedar and it will last because it is, um, has natural uh, chemicals in it that will inhibit rot. So great tree. Cedar loves wetter soils. Duck fir likes those dry slopes, very different settings. Douglas fir recommendation is to keep those pruned a bit to keep this sort of the sail effect from happening so the wind can move through um, the tree and not be dangerous. The problem with trees like this in settings where houses have gone in and the tree has been left is that the tree was growing in a forest. It was growing in a grouping and once you remove all the other trees from around it they become less um, less stable. So Planting them from scratch can be helpful because they will develop to the site and be healthier and stronger. So let's go through this quickly. Um, California native plants are lots of different things that we grow already, like, you know, sages and yuccas and the ceanothus, which has that bright, bright blue flower, different manzanitas. Um, Carex is a grass-like plant and then fleabane is this little daisy thing here. These are great little rock garden plants. These guys appreciate dry, hot weather, sunny sites usually. Mediterranean plants, a lot of our um, herbs that we grow in the mint family, lavender, sage, rosemary, um, oregano, thyme are all in this group. Uh, things like rock rose. Rock rose is a great plant if you have a horsetail area. It's a great plant for trying to um, outcompete the horsetail because it gets so dense that it will shade it out pretty well. And then calendula is sort of this classic a community garden plant that everybody grows. Wonderful for harvesting for herb, herbal use, but also will self-seed. 
And so you can just plant it once and just always have a little patch of it. Um, it can go all over the place. So you wanna be harvesting those flowers so you don't have as much seed spread. New Zealand plants that I mentioned, a lot of smaller leaf things. These are the things that can be a little more tender, Libertia, Euphorbias, Hebes and Formium, um, which is also New Zealand flax, um, can be uh, very tender here, but they are quite beautiful. They have beautiful leaf arrangements and beautiful colors and appreciate the um, dry summers here. So design considerations. Think about the height and spread of your mature plant. Don't put a plant in on a walkway that you're gonna forever having to be pruning. That's not fair to the tree or to you. Um, consider whether evergreen and deciduous works in which setting and have a mix of both. They have different qualities for wildlife and evergreen trees help, as I mentioned, keep the area warmer and um, can provide a year round shelter to our native wildlife. Um, you want to have things in layers. So if you can't have a really big tree, you know, your biggest tree is going to be the top of your canopy. But think about it sort of in terms of like you're creating a forest. Um, think about the textures of the plants you're putting in, how they look, whether you need color and seasonality, um, those mass groupings if they're good. And the odds and thirds is this picture, the left, this uh, bottom left, this is a technique in photography to think about how you're placing plants so that they look good. If you have two plants, it's a line. If you have four plants, it's a line no or a square, no matter how you place them or a triangle or it'll be a diamond. But if you create um, things in, in thirds, if you have like three plants, you know, or plants in, uh, that are in odd numbers, you will have um, better look to the landscape. And then you wanna make sure that you plant a diverse garden. You wanna be able to attract beneficial wildlife. And these are all native um, birds and the bee here that are from the Northwest is the anise honeybee bird and the little wren and then Pacific wren and then uh, the bumblebee that's just off a of catmint flower in my backyard. So catmint flower is quite small. So this is quite a, a big enlargement. Um, make sure you have year round interest. So you can have beautiful bark on a tree, but even that hydrangea flower that dried out that catches the snow can be quite attractive fall color, summer color, spring color. Think about functionality. You can have an espaliered uh, fence made out of apple trees that becomes, you know, the fence between one area of your yard and another. You can combine things like they do in permaculture to benefit plants. So this is a, a vegetable garden technique, but you can also do this with garden settings as well and thinking about can some vine grow up a tree or do you have an old tree that needs to be cut down but you leave part of the stump in so that a, you can grow a vine up over it. Um, so there's different ways you can sort of capitalize on that. You really want to avoid noxious plants. There are different uh, classes and when you look at the list it can be a little confusing because we think of things like camellia and blackberries you know oh my gosh it's everywhere and it's not a class A plant because it is everywhere. It's too widespread for them to, to be able to require it be managed. But there are some things that are economically devastating for our agriculture or for ranching or for other reasons. And so those things need to be managed. So things like garlic mustard, for instance, which loves the shade and is edible and permaculturists love this plant, but it's a really terrible plant for the Northwest because it outcompetes the native vegetation. Um, Bishop's weed, on the other hand, is just a weed of concern and it's sold in nurseries and it's still sold and shouldn't be because it's a terrible invasive weed. Um, you want to create habitat, which is an area that basically is an environment that's occupied by any particular organism. Um, this is, you know, food for this bee and then there's an earwig in there too. So, you know, they live up in these flowers, this earwig's living up in there. That's its habitat but it could be, habitat could be your entire yard as well. And to create that, you want to have food, water, shelter, and nesting sites. Um, you know, the flower, uh, the food can be flower nectar or fallen fruit that's fermented or um, leaf of a plant. Um, it could be pollen off, the, off of a plant. 
the shelter could be you know any number of things that are in your yard and all the things that we've been talking about it could even be bare soil where a bumblebee queen needs to lay or create her nest um, and other native bees um, create ground nests um, beetle banks it could be groupings of grass where beetles hide out and safety so that they can come out later and eat the slugs in your yard um, you want to have water you could have moving water uh, or you could just have a bird bath um, and then nesting sites could be um, as varied as you like. Um, having that canopy layer will help you with that. Having the thicketed plants will help you with that. But you can amend that by adding old logs or snags. You could craft, you know, have crafted bird houses. Um, people make bee houses and insect hotels. You can add all that to the garden as well. And then when you're trying to maximize for pollinators, you want to plant in groups so you can maximize efficiency for them um, to move through the landscape. You want to keep the bloom season in mind. You want to have as much extension on that season from late winter to late fall. And it's usually like December, January when there's not a lot happening, um, but a little bit starts to happen even then. Um, diversity in shape, color, fragrance, size of plant, um, all in seasonality. Uh, some weeds, be tolerant of them. Dandelions are an excellent source of early food for bumblebees. And then remember that caterpillar young are larvae. They are gonna eat the leaves of plants. So plant some things that they can have and um, eat in your yard as well. The, the cat mint on the left again, that's the or the catnip, that's the plant that that other little bee was in. So this plant has been covered with insects all summer long. It was the most powerful pollinator plant I had in my yard all summer. If you have extra pesticides sitting around, you know, rather than use them, if you don't, you know, if you're not gonna use them for anything at all, um, and we would prefer probably that you didn't, especially if you don't need to, um, go ahead and take them to the hazardous waste sites and just get rid of them. So you don't need to worry about them. And the one closest to shoreline is up at um, Haller Lake up on Stone Avenue North. Then I just want to remind people about planting techniques. And we talked about this a little bit more in the last class. Um, you don't want to plant woody plants too deeply into the ground. You need to make sure you see the trunk flare where the root meets the root, or where the root meets the trunk and it flares out. That needs to be at soil level. You don't want to over mulch like in this picture on the right. They call those um, mulch volcanoes. You're going to smother the tree. Partly it puts pressure against the bark and partly it creates moisture, which can rot the bark out. Um, and the bark is there to protect the tree. So this is my big message with planting correctly is about woody plants in particular. But basically any tree or vegetable or perennial or flower you plant, you need to root, loosen the root ball up to make sure the roots don't circle around and you need to space them correctly. Um, you don't want to amend a tree hole, but you want to amend the planting bed that it's going into. And you want, you can add a little compost to smaller plants. It's not going to hurt too much. So here's some local ex expertise in the area. You've got Sky close by, the Mammoth K Rare Plant Nursery, Go Natives Nursery. These are places to find plants, to ask them questions. Um, and then the my program that I managed to the hotline, garden hotline, call us if you have questions as you're designing things, we can help you figure things out. And we shop from these guys. We buy a lot of plants from Go Natives, putting in a pollinator garden at the Rainier Beach farm um, down in uh, the Rainier Beach neighborhood. And we've bought a ton of plants from these guys to put in there. And then this is just an example of the tremendous amount of resources, not only in the Northwest, but just in books in general. Um, I realized I left a book off of here as I was talking. Um, it's a great book to have when you're walking the neighborhood. It's called Trees of Seattle. And, you know, don't let the name throw you. These trees are everywhere um, because you can look things up and, you know, see what they look like um, in the book. But the book is, if you want to walk through Seattle, actually lists trees in the city. You can go look and see what they look like when they're real size. Because the point of that is that you don't want to just look at a plant in a nursery and see it in a one gallon pot. You want to see what it really is going to look like so you can place it properly to begin with. And that is all I have. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, <clears throat> so I did actually get kicked out of my own Zoom meeting for a minute. So I lost a couple <laughs> of our first questions. Oh, no. Um, but I, I think I remember them and they might even show up for you as well, Laura. So yeah, I see the submit button one and, uh, and then your answer and the poll and then from Lynn and then somebody said that they had to leave and they hope that there's a video recording. Okay. And you answered that. Um, so uh, I believe that the question um, was about- Oh, that's the chat, Never mind. Okay. <laughs> there was one question about morning glory, how to get yeah. rid of morning glory. I think morning glory, blackberry and ivy. Yeah. <laughs> which is just a great question. So maybe- we is, it, is it V or Vi? Well, I'm sorry, either way. It, you have three of the worst things in your garden. <laughs> yes, it says, what can I do to get rid of morning glory weeds? And we also have ivy and blackberry. The reason those are difficult is because of the way they grow. Morning glory grows through an underground stem called a rhizome. It grows all over the place um, really hard because it goes very deep into the ground. You have to smother it out if you can. Um, we have a little video on the Garden Hotline website. Um, you ought to take a look at. It goes through some of the steps of that. The hardest place to get rid of that is when it's growing like right at the base of a shrub and you can't get at the, you know, get into the ground under it and a rockery where you can't, you, you know, you're not going to dismantle your rockery. But if you have in an open bed area, um, you can do some deep sheet mulching with cardboard and chips on top of it, provided you don't put that up against woody, woody trunks of plants. What that does is kind of fool the plant and it starts moving its rhizomes up higher into the soil, sort of higher up because you've smothered it deeply. And then when you pull the stuff away, they're much easier to find because they're closer to the surface of the soil. So it's this weird little trick that we found over the years, but it's only really possible where you have an open area for that. Um, blackberry, you know, whack it back. And then you can borrow weed wrenches from the King, um, the King County weed folks um, and, and get them out of the ground and get the this big main stem out. And Ivy, there was a woman, I um, was one of my neighbors when I lived in Wedgwood and we were right above Thornton Creek and she took care of the green belt there. And she got rid of all that Ivy herself as one individual by smothering it. She put black plastic over it um, and you can do this with landscape fabric just to kill it. And then she would come in after it was dead and she'd roll it up, you know, to get it out of there. So she wasn't like pulling it up, but basically by killing it and smothering it. And she had that on there for like, you know, six months and then she would remove it and then it, it kills it and all the roots dissipate. So you can just roll it up and toss it, get rid of it. Um, it's all work. I'm not going to minimize that. It is work. Yes. I um, plant under cedar trees. Uh, and Monique says hostas maybe. Um, only if you're watering them extra because hostas require a lot of water um, compared to some other things. I would look at things like, um, I had a hydrangea, I think it was a, called Anomala. It's a shrubby hydrangea that doesn't have a super colorful flower, but it tolerates really dry shade. Um, also that Vancouveria I mentioned are epimediums or some of those ferns like a sword fern would work there well there. The plant list booklet that's listed as a resource, look for dry shade plants to put under a cedar because what's happening is the cedar is going to use up most of that water. They love water. And you get a lot of needles on the herb, you know, the scaly needles on the ground. Um, let's see. Gotcha. So I, I think we're back to my questions. There was one, uh, there was one about dewatering a hot tub and oh. if the chlorine would be, would be uh, bad for the probably. landscape and plants. Yeah, yeah, probably. I think and we it, are. Like, yeah, it's bleach. So yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Right. And just speaking from, I used to work on our surface water team and we do require if you're going to empty a pool or a hot tub that it be de dechlorinated before it can empty into like runoff into the street. Great. Um, okay. So, next question. Cameron, does that get dechlorinated enough that it then could be like poured on your lawn? Yes, exactly. Okay. 
Cool. I forget what the requirement is. There's some number. And, so and probably I don't, yeah. you want to do that <laughs> when you need to water your lawn, right? Because right. then you use all that water and you don't waste it. You actually exactly. put it back on something you need. Exactly. So our next question is from Nancy. Um, to create a wild garden, do I need the soil or can I just add topsoil or just drop seed on the existing nasty <laughs> rocky soil? <laughs> um, depends on what you want to plant. So plant specific. Some things won't mind that nasty rocky soil at all. Um, there's a lot of wildflowers actually in wildflower mixes um, when you're buying a wildflower mix now, make sure you're buying one that's formulated for the Northwest from a reputable seed seller that's not full of, um, you know, invasive plants. Um, and there are a lot of those. And you can call us on the hotline and we can sort of direct you to that. But um, <coughs> those are, there are lots of cool wildflowers. So if you're just looking for small scale kind of like annuals that bloom and then drop their seeds. There's lots of things like that you can use. There's different kinds of poppies and clarkia. There's a lot of really cool native wildflowers that grow up in the meadows and the mountains where the soil isn't great. You know, it is rocky and it's, it's not the best. So things like that would work real well. If you want to create a wild garden that has like grasses, then you can get like native grasses that will do better in that kind of setting. And there are lawn mixes that are made for native lawns, you could just use those and then put wildflowers in amongst them. And that would make a ni nice mix. Or you could get shrubs that tolerate that kind of setting um, as well. And then it looks like we have um, some requests for pruning classes or resources. I think the only one that comes to my mind, I think Sky Nursery sometimes has some, some pruning classes yeah. Um, I don't know if you know of any others off the top of your head, Laura. I know Swanson's does a really good um, Japanese maple pruning class. Mm. Plant Amnesty does pruning um, seminars. They're really the best one who will do kind of a range of pruning because it depends on what it is. A rhododendron, if you're re rehabbing it versus just doing some maintenance on it, is different kind of pruning. A plant that has multiple stems, like I said, you take the stems out from the bottom rather than pruning from the top. So depends on what the plant is. Um, and it's quite varied, you know, when you prune a wisteria, which is twice a year, grape is twice a year, but when is that to maximize benefits? Um, but Plant Amnesty has those classes. Um, and then specialty classes at the nurseries, like for Japanese maple, it's really good to know how to do that to keep it looking right. Awesome, yeah. thanks. Yeah, it's really a whole art but yeah, I think there's a couple good, I'll, we'll see if we can add any resources to the resource list around pruning. Um, okay, another question popped up to the top yeah. was on ivy and blackberry on a yeah. hillside, not wanting to remove it. That's a great question. So um, uh, you wanna do it a bit at a time. So sort of, sort of stage it and then you can do, and I think we might've talked about this in the first class actually, because we talked about removing lawn from hillsides. You can get um, compost in, you can put compost into things like a burlap bag and sort of stage it on the hill to provide some support and put plants in. So wherever you have cleared, plant it, get, it, get things planted and then do the next section and the next section. So don't, you don't need to rip it all out at once unless you have the resources, time and money to be able to plant the whole thing at once, which is usually a lot of work. Um, so I would recommend certain pieces and then, um, you know, put in things that are going to hold the hillside. The um, Washington State Department of Ecology has a great resource on plants that hold hillsides up well, um, but it's hard to find anymore. So email us on the hotline or call us. We have it. I think we've downloaded the PDF somewhere because they used to have it just on websites, like you could go through the different pages and they've moved it all offline into a resource uh, format. But it's a really good one. Awesome, thanks. So uh, next question. Yeah, uh, that <laughs> too. <some> goats. <laughs> Absolutely, Steve, thank you. There are people who will do that. If you have a big enough space, usually it's bigger spaces. They often, like for municipal areas or you know, big commercial sites, they'll pen them in with fencing and just let them go. They will eat all the blackberry off the hillside. We actually, yeah, we use yeah. those for maintenance and uh, yeah. for some of the city stormwater ponds and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. 
um, Earthcraft Services is the is the guy we use. Right. The goat guy. Um, okay, so what would you plant with a dwarf Japanese maple in dappled shade? Um, it sounds like it's in a large barrel container. Um, some sort of, you know, oh. partner planting that could kind of spill over the side. The sweet potato vine would be fine. I mean, you could think about it as doing annual things that just grow, you know, during the summer and flower for you. Um, you know, the maple's going to take up that whiskey barrel pretty well with roots. So maybe you don't want to be digging around too much. Um, if you want something that spills over the side, um, one, th one combination I really liked a lot in the client's yard that I used to take care of on Bainbridge Island was we had a, she had a Japanese, no, it wasn't a Japanese maple. It was one, uh, I forget the name of it. It was the one with the really fiery orange stems. Mm. And we had um, Japanese forest grass underneath it. And it's not a draping plant in the sense that it's not a vine, but it, it drapes over in its growth habit. And it was a really beautiful combination. And they, you can get it in a variegated form. And it's really, once you get it established in there, it would just fill in under the tree and it would look really beautiful. Cool. Fun suggestion. Uh, question, you're going to expand on why not to ad, uh, amend a tree planting hole. Yeah. So the problem with tree roots is that um, they sort of get used to the soil they're growing in. If they hit another um, profile of soil, they may not grow as efficiently into it, especially if it's not as rich as an amended plant hole. So if you put too much compost in there with it, it's gonna just sort of stop and then grow around in that good, it'll keep seeking that good soil out. And then you'll get what we call girdling roots. You'll have roots that wrap around themselves and could wrap around the tree. And uh, that can kill a tree actually eventually. You want to encourage them to grow into the native soils. So rather than amend the hole, you wanna amend the bed that they're going into. And you can do that when you plant. And then and just plant into native soil and top dress and you can keep top dressing the whole thing which will eventually change the soil underneath it awesome thanks um what ground covers are good under dry and wet conditions unsheltered um so pretty exposed um dry and wet conditions um if they're dry in the summer and wet in the winter, you know, there's lots of things in those plant lists that would work in those conditions. Um, ground cover wise, um, some of them are pretty tolerant of anything. Mahonia is pretty tolerant of most things. Um, the strawberry wouldn't like the wet condition. It likes it drier. Um, ferns would probably do okay. Like, you know, even a sword fern can tolerate some moisture. It's not gonna kill it. Um, deer fern would probably be fine. Um, unsheltered from trees, but exposed to elements and temps. Um, boy, yeah, that's a trickier situation. If it's a ground cover, there's one ground cover that's kind of a bully, but it is, um, it would grow anywhere. Um, that's, it's a relative of, um, like salmonberry. It's a type of rubus. But you want to be careful where you put that because it can kind of take over an area. But that would grow in, in any harsh conditions for sure. Cool. It's a and pretty yeah. plant and it has edible fruit on it. Which one is that? Rubus. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I can't remember the species, Calicinoides maybe. Okay, cool. And, and just, yeah, we're sending out a bunch of plant list resources. So they're really, yeah, really good things you can just sort of explore you know, for all of those different iterations. Yeah. Of, and that you know, book, Right Plant, Right Place, that's a great book because it lists, you know, it has all these different conditions. Actually, the Sunset Western Garden book has some good sort of like, you know, different idea sections as well. Awesome. Um, next one. Uh, is it best to prune roadies before relocating them? How far should I prune? Uh, and is now a good time before the first frost to relocate? Um, you can move the roadie anytime, um, it, as long as it's not, you know, 90 degrees or, you know, 20 degrees, uh, 30 degrees. You want the soil to be sort of warm. Now's a great time to be moving them. We've been getting enough rain. That's helpful. You still need to water it in. Um, 
the only reason I would prune it is if it makes it easier to handle, uh, to move it, you know, because sometimes they get really wide and you can't get to that root ball. They have a very shallow and wide root ball, so it may not be a problem. They tend to be wider than deep. Um, and then if you prune now, you will prune flowers off of it because they've already set their buds. So I didn't get my rhododendron pruned off my back porch this year. I just, you know, it's too busy. I didn't get to it. So when it next year, I'll have to take it back even farther than I would have um, this year. Um, but I'll lose my flowers if I prune it now because all those buds are already sitting there. So you can't do that. Um, you know, the Northwest is funny. We may get frost and the ground doesn't freeze. So as long as the ground isn't frozen, you can move plants like this around. Cool. And when, just a reminder, when is the right time to prune rhodes? Rhododendrons, you prune or, them yeah. after they bloom, after the flowers have faded. Um, you know, when you would go in there and deadhead them, that's when you right. want to start pruning them. Because then they're going to grow new growth and then set buds again. Gotcha. Next one, uh, wild rabbits. Oh. Uh, definitely in my neighborhood as well, over here in Ridgecrest. Um, any suggestions for sort of browse resistant shrubs? I've seen some that are say they're deer resistant, but I don't think I've seen anything that's rabbit resistant. Yeah, I nothing's completely deer resistant or rabbit resistant. Um, it depends on how much food they're getting. So a deer will try anything. A rabbit will try anything. Rabbits tend though to like, they don't like onions. So they're not gonna eat onions out of your veggie garden typically. If, if they have, let me know and we'll change that advice. But um, I've never seen them do it. I've grown we had a vegetable garden we managed for tilth over at the Pickering Barn in Issaquah, which had tons of rabbits and tons of deer, and the onions never got bothered by anybody. Um, so sometimes we put the lettuce inside and put onions around the outside just to keep them away. Uh, bunnies seem to like things like brassicas, cabbages, and broccoli and kale a lot. So they like those very um, vegetative leaves, something that's spiky, leathery, they're not gonna like as much. I, they were all uh, over underneath like the Mahonia. They didn't bother that at all. Um, they did eat, um, did snip off some low parts on the, like the red stem dogwoods cause it's a little more tender. Um, and the deer totally ate that. They love that. Gotcha. Oh, and it sounds like just referring back to the question about transplanting a roadie that it is a huge roadie over 14 oh. feet tall. Ah! Oh my goodness. You could. So if it's really huge, you could prune it. What I would recommend is getting a hold of some of the um, rehab pruning video information from Plant Amnesty to learn how to do it right and, and proceed as though you're trying to rehab the plant and bring it down in size and then, and then move it and let it grow back. Because if you don't prune it right, it's going to be kind of this crazy mess when it grows back of a bunch of upright shoots and not good branching structure. Cool. But yes, you want to prune that. <laughs> gotcha. Unless okay. you have equipment. Yeah. <laughs> Big old dingo or. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mary Lou's asking, um, she'd like to plant some smallish fruit trees. Um, any recommendations for apple or apricot varieties? Yeah, so apricots are difficult in the Northwest unless you have a nice warm spot. Um, for years, I don't know if it's still there, but for years when I was in high school there, I noticed this one up on Capitol Hill um, that was huge and had a ton of fruit on it, but it was in this yard that was sheltered completely from winds um, in their front yard. Uh, the problem with them is they're very prone to fungal diseases and they bloom at a time of year when the weather's really wet here. And so that usually enters through the flowers and then spreads through the tree. So they're hard to keep alive and healthy. Um, if you want, really want an apricot, I would look at like the rain tree catalog and, and see what they say about the varieties they have these days. Um, there may be some that are more disease resistant. I still, I haven't looked in a few years, to be honest. I, um, I have looked at peaches. There's more luck with peaches actually than apricots. Mm -hmm. um, apples are great. Uh, depends on how much room you have. There's all kinds of dwarf and root stock. There's some that are just columnar if you just have a very urban space um, and small. But the thing about apples is you, you have to protect them from codling moth and, and apple maggot. 
um, which means you have to either cover the whole tree with netting or you got to bag the fruit because otherwise you run the risk of getting insects in them and then the fruit is not as usable. It's not storable. And if it's apple maggot, it's not very use usable. Cool. And uh, Steve adds to not forget about figs to that list. Uh, figs, yeah, figs are, they get big. You have to have good room for them. Um, and you have to understand their fruiting pattern because they have a fruit on them right now that usually in a warmer climate would live over and be the second crop, but we usually don't get to keep that crop. We get that early, that other crop in the, that develops in the spring. Um, so when you look at advice about fig trees on the internet, be aware that they're talking often about a climate that isn't ours and it's not gonna behave like they say. So look for, look for information. Swanson's has a great fig tree uh, advice sheet for the Northwest. And I'd add too, yeah, I think Sky Nursery has some pretty good handouts that they usually have like up by the registers on different um, fruit tree varieties. And Do you varieties. know if they have one about figs? I haven't looked I, at that one. I don't remember yeah. seeing one. Yeah. I found the Swanson's one when I was trying to like, trying to show somebody what I meant by those two crops and it, yeah. and it explained it pretty well. So I gave them that. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so this is, I like this question. Uh, my daughter's house is on a hillside. The upside soil is serious clay. I thought it was rock when dry. What can be done to amend that clay? Oh, wow. Um, compost. Compost, compost, compost. Compost amends everything. Sandy soil that doesn't hold water, compost. Clay soil you need to break up, compost. And what I re would recommend in particular is a compost that's woody. So typically we, we're saying when people are putting in veggie gardens, don't buy the woody compost. But if you're doing this, yes, do buy the woody compost. Um, Gardener in Bloom, I think has one, there's a, a soil building one and, but um, Sky has a great um, display at the entrance to the store where the cashiers are. And uh, you can see what the combi or the products are because they have them in little cups that you can feel. And maybe they don't right now because of COVID, I'm not sure. But it's, it's great when you can see it. But I think the um, Gardner and Bloom products tend to be a little woodier. And so those would be really good ones. Or you could get, you know, any kind of compost you put in there would be fine, um, really. Um, and then put wood chips up there too, because the wood chips will help as they break down. There's a lot of microorganisms in there that will help to break up that clay as well. Awesome. Yeah. And like we said, last session was all on soils and amendments. So feel free to check out that video yeah. uh, if you weren't able to intend that. So next question, um, same plants, oh, some plants that are dry and shade friendly under Western hemlocks. Uh, yeah. So yes, the same kinds of things under Western hemlocks. Uh, they don't use water as you know, deeply as a cedar does, but they still will. Any conifer is going to use up water in the soil. Um, so any of those things I mentioned, like, you know, hydrangeas do pretty well in those settings, and especially that one hydrangea and the um, things like organ grape and anything in that family will do really well there. Hellebores would do fine there. You would need to give them a little supplemental water, but maybe you have them a little closer to the front where you can get to them easier. Uh, but I wouldn't do things like hostas and things that are just going to be like really struggling under there. Things with more, think about things with more leathery kind of tougher leaves, they will do better in that setting. Awesome. And um, when is the best time of year to relocate an established lilac tree? I have one that's uh, too close to the house in sandy soil. Um, when it's dormant. So as soon as it's fully dropped its leaves, which is mine's about there. Um, so, you know, when it's dropped its leaves, and um, the soil is still workable, uh, you can go ahead and move it. Um, so lilac sucker, so you may get new growth from the base when you do that, um, which isn't the end of the world. Sometimes if you don't have a single trunk lilac anyway, this is another way you prune them. It's the same way you do something like a mock orange where you take out older stems and let the new ones grow up because they tend to eventually all the flowers get on top. You can't get to them or smell them anyway. Great, yeah. The whole, yeah, the, it's where the different pruning strategies for different yeah. plants, it's, it's so, there's such a range of, of solutions. And plant amnesty has 
excellent advice about all of that. Yep. And uh, Jennifer mentioned in the chat too that UW Botanic Gardens has had pruning classes in the past. And oh, great. The link to that. Wonderful. Um, okay. Uh, just one more question here about is there any uh, guidance or advice about adding a water permeable fabric barrier over amended soil, then mulching over that uh, when planting areas? So I'm not, I'm not a fan of landscape fabric unless I'm using it like to kill ivy or do something functional like that. The problem with it is that you put it down, you put mulch over it, organic matter falls into it, the mulch starts to break down, um, things grow in it, they get attached to it, they're impossible to weed out. They get embedded in the weave of the fabric. It's even harder to weed things. It doesn't yeah. always prevent everything. It compacts the soil. It doesn't let it breathe as well. So it's not, it's something you should use temporarily to try and, you know, like contain a problem or get ahead of something and then get it out of there. Um, we, we had some great photos. I think it's on the hotline Facebook page um, that a friend of mine I used to work with at Swanson sent me. Um, in a yard she had just moved into in it. Somebody had put landscape fabric, fabric down and been mulched over over the years. All the root mass too of plants were sort of, sort of like growing in this weird layer and not going into the soil. So she pulled it apart and took some great photos to show us what was yeah. going on there. It is pretty brutal. Yeah, I used to work as a landscaper and yeah, you find yards where they just, there's little kind of shreds of it left, but it's not really functioning in the way it was supposed to right. and it's impossible to pull out. Yeah, it it's hard. It just gets to be yeah. a mess. It's a good tool for like restoration and killing things and then getting rid of, you know, taking it up again. Um, there, um, there's a couple things at the top here, Cameron. Um, there's one after Vi's one about the hot tub about planting underneath a giant old maple tree. Do you have that one? I don't have that one, so go ahead. So that's going to be sort of the same as what we talked about with conifers. Um, the only difference there um, is that uh, maple is a deciduous in the winter, and so you could put some like ephemeral, really early blooming things like um, um, bleeding heart and uh, bulbs that could come up and bloom and leaf out and then the tree shades out and then they like that shade or the bulb disappears into the ground. So there's some, you can play with that a lot more and put some really colorful things in that bloom when there is sun on the ground because the tree hasn't leafed out yet. So that's kind of some fun um, things. Cool, were there any others at the top? The, the only last one I'm seeing is that uh, we couldn't find the video uh, about the sheet mulching. Uh, no, know. that's it. And that, I'm um, sorry, that is on the YouTube, Garden Hotline YouTube site. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. We'll see if I, we can find a link to that as well to share out. There's some fun videos there. There's one about mulching. So all the stuff we've been talking about, why not to mulch against a tree. There's one about morning glory. There's one about our bindweed. There's one about um, moles in the lawn. And all three of those are done sort of comically, you know, they're sort of funny, um, but they have good information. And then there's some, a lot of other good ones. And we have links to other videos and channels that we recommend uh, that you can follow from there as well. Awesome. Well, thanks so much everybody. So before you go, the lucky folks who have stuck, stuck around, I'm gonna launch the poll for the compost raffle. So uh, you do have to be a Shoreline resident for this. Um, and if you are, for some reason, not able to see the poll, just um, let me know in the chat and I'll make sure you're entered in that. So we'll give people, you know, a full minute here. Um, well, if there's any other questions, we can also take those. Um, share my screen. Um, just looking up, so uh, while people are still filling out whether they'd like the raffle, like we still have a few people. Um, yeah, just that this has been a great series. So uh, thankful for, for Laura and her team um, that have been helping with these. We have one left, which is next week, same time, same place. Um, the link to register for that one is at 
www.shorelinewa.gov slash natural yard care. Um, so go ahead and uh, check that out if you want to um, join us for our last one. It's on fall garden prep. So really going through how to winterize your garden, a uh, little bit on pruning, kind of the fall winter cleanup uh, techniques that can really set us up for success, you know, while our garden is um, heading into a more dormant period, um, but, you know, that will come out in a flush of life in the spring. So uh, join us for that. And like I said, it will be sending out tomorrow an email with a link to the recording, um, the raffle prize winners, and a list of resources that we compiled uh, from this presentation. And I'll give people just six more seconds if you want to enter the compost raffle prize. So um, I think we almost have everybody there. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you next week, hopefully. So have a great night, everybody. So Cameron, how many people were there? Uh, we had, it looked like up to 66, 65. Because the last I looked, it was like 58. And then I started talking. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you want, I, I can maybe at the end to share out kind of all the different reports that they give That'd be you. Great. you can yeah. see, because sometimes, you know, people join and drop off. So yes. it'll tell you how many unique viewers there were. Great. Um, cool. That's well, a fun, fun talk. It's a lot of information. Uh, yeah. You know, and everybody has their special plants that they want to hear about. It's totally it's hard to cover. <laughs> That was a, yeah, a lot of territory. It can go in a lot of different directions there, but hopefully it was helpful. I think got a lot of good feedback here um, from folks. Great. Um, yeah, and let me know. I think is Rangard's going to do the next one. We're going to do it together. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, we'll take different parts of it. Great. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much. And thanks for taking all the questions. Yeah. And, Super uh, fun. Yeah, have a great night. I'll see you see you next time. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. Okay. Yep. Bye. Take care. Bye everybody.